Good morning, everybody. So look, 45 years ago, when this conference convened for the very, very first time, humpback whales were nearly extinct. Just a couple of weeks ago, Noah announced, not this Noah, Noah announced <laughs> that they were removing most species of humpback whales from the endangered species list. Can we, <laughs> right? Humpback whales rebounded because choices were made to protect them. Because choices were made to protect them. 30 years ago, Dr. Suzuki reminded us that a so-called hole was forming in the ozone layer, right? And uh, we've been hearing all year that scientists are reporting that the ozone layer is recovering and is en route to a complete recovery within most of our children's lifetimes. So think about this. A, a wholly unnatural disaster is being mitigated, if not entirely averted, because choices were made to protect our children's future. Choices were made to protect our children's future. Most recently, maybe 10 years ago, solar energy consumption in the UK represented one-tenth of one percent of the total electricity generated. One-tenth of one percent. Just last week, it was reported that over the past six months, more electricity was generated in the UK by solar than by coal. Okay? So amidst all the darkness, we have a little bit of light, right? We have a million electric cars on the road. We just ratified the Paris Agreement. These seemingly impossible landmarks are the result of significant public engagement and ultimately choices made by civil society, by businesses, and by government leaders to lead us all towards a more sustainable future. So we know that these choices are underpinned not just by understanding and knowledge, but they're underpinned by experiences and say it with me, love, right? Right? We always protect who and what we love. Just like Dr. Suzuki last night said, right? We love air and water and our children and our children's children. So today, we are joined by four world-class cultivators of love who have devoted their careers to inspiring people to make good choices. That's what we're going to talk about today. That bridge between inspiration and impact is good choices, right? So Charlotte, raise your hand, Charlotte, is an assistant professor in sustainability education and serves as the director of undergraduate programs at Duke University's Nicholas School of the Environment. Blue Devils, go Blue, Blue Devils. All right, sorry, kind of badger country. All right. Jan Erickson is the president of, environment, president of the Foundation for Environmental Education based in Denmark, the happiest country on earth. We could use, <laughs> bring it Jan, we need, we need some of that happiness. Julia Washburn, on my end, started with the National Park Service over 25 years ago, no doubt with the Teen Ranger program. Uh, she started actually as a park ranger. After numerous appointments serving our country's national parks, Julia now serves as the National Park Service Associate Director for Interpretation, Education, and Volunteers. Welcome, Julia. And uh, we have no time for that. And uh, Kartikeya Sarabai is the founding director of India's Center for Environmental Education, whose 40 offices across India uh, are central to promoting the key role of education and sustainable development. Thank you so much for traveling so far to share your insights with us today, Kartikeya. So let's begin the discussion, right? Our discussion is going to focus around choices and around how those choices are informed by inspiration that ultimately lead to impact. Um, everybody start thinking about your questions for this panel today, because you're all going to get a chance to fire away with your insights and your questions. All right, let's start with inspirations. Um, and I'll start with Kartikeya to my right. Uh, question number one, can you recall those earliest inspirations that influenced you personally and ultimately led to your choice of a career in the fields of environmental education and sustainability? Thank you. It's uh, wonderful to be here. 
first of all. And uh, I was thinking about that, uh, what really changed that career. And I think it was in 67 when we were having a drought in Bihar, in India. And it was the last of the major crisis. And I spent my summer just going around looking at what people were doing. And the power of people acting, NGOs, civil society groups, communities, they went to areas where even the governments could not reach. And, and that was the time when I think I took a decision that this is what I want to do, that I think we could do it. The word environment was not there, but I wanted to work in, in development. And I started looking at the power of communication in education. People didn't know uh, what was happening very close by. There were solutions there. There were, there were people who could get them together. And therefore, the communication started happening. At another completely personal level, my son was growing up, we were in, at, I was at MIT, and at five he was looking at planes and he loved to see, he knew the names of all the planes. But in India, you, you didn't have that variety. You only had one plane, which was the Dakota at that time. So he started uh, looking at birds in the garden and asking me what those were. And I didn't have a clue of what those birds were, but I knew there was a book. And I got the book, and I think for the first year or so, we only knew the birds by the page numbers. <laughs> but, 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 but there it was, and just the, fact, just the realization that all this was around us, around me, and I did not know about that reality. And from there, we went into understanding nature, and India was already thinking about how environment and development had to go together. Indira Gandhi had made that statement in Stockholm. So when we started work in, in, uh, in 84, when the center was, when, when the Ministry of Environment was being formed, we said that unless you have education as a key strategy of India, this is not going to work. And 85, I'll just end with that, that 85, I came to my first NAAEE. And I should say that that inspiration, wow. that inspiration was huge to come here and see what was the exciting work which was going on here. And I wish, and we made many, many partnerships, many people in this room. Uh, that's when I met Judy and, and several others. And, and I think the inspiration which this hall has is something which you don't realize. I was just talking to a friend from the National Park Service that she doesn't know how a seed sown at that time has led to a major interpretive program in India. So the inspirations are from all over, but they're certainly from this room. So you, you have a constellation of deeply personal experiences with your family, you have public figures who influence your perspective, and you had colleagues that kept you in this field for so many years. That's right. All right, well then, Julia, let's, you just had a tribute paid to your influence and your earliest memories and what propelled you to a lifetime of service. Well, well thanks, Noah, and, and, uh, and thanks, Judy, and everyone for, for having me here. So this one was easy for me. So I grew up in Washington, D.C., in urban Washington, D.C., um, and I was a kid with learning challenges um, and in the early 70s that uh, not a lot was really known about dyslexia, dysgraphia, ADD and that sort of thing. And so I was really, really struggling in school. And I used to spend every moment away from school outdoors. Um, I lived near Rock Creek Park, which is a large urban park. And um, at around age seven, um, I became a junior ranger at Rock Creek Park. <laughs> Woo! So this is my Junior Ranger hat. And um, it's funny because I grew up to become the Chief Ranger of Rock Creek Park. And when I became the Chief Ranger of Rock Creek Park, my mother dug into her closet and she pulled this out. She should have been a curator. She keeps everything. And um, she pulled this out and see, remember, you, you were, you're already a ranger at Rock Creek Park. So it reminded me that, um, I keep it on my desk, actually. I keep it on my desk in my office because it reminds me that um, the, the uh, opportunities that we facilitate for children in nature re really do make a difference. We might not see it right away. We have plenty of studies now that show it, but um, it, it, this is a tangible, a tangible reminder. So a corollary to this is that as, when I became the Associate Director for Interpretation, Education, and Volunteers in Washington, D.C., and I went into my office in the headquarters building in the Department of Interior, um, and, and one day, not too long after I got the job, I got a knock on the door, and this um, lovely young woman in uniform, park ranger uniform, um, knocked on the door, and she said, um, I just wanted to come visit you. I, I wonder if you remember who I am. 
And I looked at her, and I looked at her name, and I said, you know, your name is really familiar, and you look kind of familiar to me, but I, I can't place you. And she said, when you worked at Fort DuPont Park, another urban park in urban Washington, D.C., she said, when you worked at Fort DuPont Park, and, I, and, and you ran a junior ranger program there. I was one of your junior rangers. <laughs> <laughs> nice. And now I'm the chief of interpretation at Wolf Trap. Um, and, and she has gone on to be a superintendent of a park. Um, and this young woman um, came from inner city D.C. Um, and through her experiences with the Park Service, she ended up going into a career of conservation, preservation, and education. So we have tangible evidence that this works. Wonderful. Paying it forward. Terrific. Yan, is, is experiences in the happiest country on earth very different? Uh, I don't think so. Uh, but uh, I, I think there were so many inspirations for, for, for my later life. So I've just tried to, to put it into five. Sure. Five examples. Firstly, when I went around with my grandpa in his little vegetable garden 60 years ago, and he was making organic growth already at that time. When forest worker Siegfried, who escorted me and taught me into the wildlife of the nearby forest from I was six, the allowance from my parents to form a nature club and allow us on our own, on bicycles, to go to the nearby nature areas, even 25 kilometers away. Wow crossing Copenhagen. It was not always easy, but we succeeded and we all survived. <laughs> when my good teacher at college brought me from nature history on species to a holistic ecological understanding and approach. And my last, and also belonging to my youth, probably a bit more activistic than now, was when I realized how important it is to stand up for what you believe in and uh, for making a change. And the successful campaign where it ended up with the Danish parliament rejecting nuclear power and bet on wind turbines. And I have to say, four days in June 2016, the whole country was covered with energy from wind turbines. Normally, only 35%, but it's still increasing. Thank you. And Charlotte, was it, was it academics first? Was it an environment first? What propelled you? Definitely environment. When I was 12 years old, my family spent the year in England while my father completed a sabbatical leave. Um, and at one point, we took a holiday to a tiny southern island called Sark. And there, early in the mornings, my father and I would go to the rocky tidal pools uncovered by low tide. And we saw things in a whole world that I had never seen before in my life. I had no idea it existed. And I think that microcosm, we talked about, well, is it better or worse for this little community when the tide is out or when the tide is in? And we could talk about the pros and cons on either side of that with no particular answer. And I think that that has formed a lot of what I think about communities now. They're, they are opaque, they are transparent, they are inclusive, they are exclusive. They are able to uh, be um, insular to themselves or they are impacted by the world around them. And um, so that was very formative. In fact, I decided I wanted to be Jacques Cousteau at that time. <laughs> and I think this audience is filled with folks who also think a lot about a number of different kinds of communities that you join and go in and out of. But as a quick addendum, in retrospect, the magic of that moment was also that I had special time with my very busy parent and shared an enthusiasm and experience that we had not shared before. It was something new to both of us. And so I often think about the role of emotion and experience and our guide in constructing our own passions and careers. So this too reminds me of the inspiration and impact that each of you provide, and I thank you. Wonderful. So, very different, yet uh, regardless of the country or the professional aspiration, very personal inspirations, very personal experiences that ultimately influenced their choices, including their professions and the like. So, let's, let's migrate from inspirations. I'll stay with you, Charlotte, and let's, let's, 
Let's talk about something a little bit more complex, actually a lot more complex. Let's see if we can deconstruct the anatomy of choice. What ultimately gets down to individuals, businesses, and policymakers making choices that support a more sustainable future? Is it, is it you know, knowing the truth? Is it science? Is it just the truth is on our side? I think we've learned that's not enough, right? Is it um, an emotional connection? Is it experiences? Is it self-interest or the moral imperative? I'm completely confused about the secret sauce. So what, and I imagine we'll have four different answers, but talk about the anatomy of choice. What actually leads to an individual saying, I'm going to do what's right? So we did have some pre-knowledge of what these questions were, but I will say <laughs> that when I got- I certainly didn't tell them. But when I got this question, I was a little daunted. And so I decided to get some help. And last night, I talked with two of our fabulous 30 under 30 leaders making a difference about what inspired them. By the way, you can hear from four of them on Saturday at noon directly. Um, CJ Golding, I, I can't see well. CJ, are you here? Wave. Yeah. Uh, CJ easily talked about what had inspired him to lead innumerable EE trips in our national parks, but he was reticent to take credit for his inspiration of others, much less his impact on them. I understood his thoughts on the one hand, that the level of uh, deciding how much impact one has can be difficult, but at 58, uh, Judy, can we have another group for maybe 60 near 60? 60 over 60? I don't know. <laughs> I'm struck that in retrospect, the impact of others for good in my life or in causing me to routinize behaviors towards environmental improvement were much stronger than I thought and may have given credit. I also spoke with Garrett Blad, and I won't see, but Garrett, stand up, wave if you're here. I was fascinated to learn of the mixture of learning and planning on the one hand and spontaneity and whimsy on the other that combined to create an amazing bicycle trip and community advocacy experience that had impact on him, a friend, and a community in crisis. I combine these to submit that although making a choice sounds like a linear process, in that moment I had not chosen, and in this moment I have chosen, that really it is not linear, it's cyclical, because every choice that one makes has multiple impacts and multiple inspirations, and they are cyclical and multiple. So I think the anatomy of choice is actually choices, and we need to think about the multiple inspirations and impacts that are a part of those iterative cycles. And so sometimes we need to celebrate and honor the small steps that comprise our journey. That's not to say we shouldn't have a clear path forward. That's not to say we should not have a robust plan to measure that progress. So this leads me to quickly mention the findings of a recent study completed with scores of experts in environmental ed by Joe Heimlich, Nicole Arduin, Judy, and me to identify the core outcomes of the field of EE. These two young lady leaders provide a fantastic illustration of the five resulting core outcomes of this study. We see two of the outcomes as foundational to the field, experience in and experience with the physical environment and two, improving social and cultural aspects of the human experience. These two foundational elements build to the fifth, the final core ultimate outcome of improved environmental health through two mediating outcomes, learning necessary skills and competences, and actually taking action and changing behavior. So foundationally, you must engage with nature and with the twin humanitarian goals of shared economic prosperity and social equity, you must also learn skills and competencies, take action in order to make environmental improvements. These young leaders, and I know many of you, embody a reach towards these core outcomes. Wonderful, thank you. Now, Julia, you mentioned to me earlier in the week that when you were a ranger and you were interacting with the public every day, you actually were conscious that you were trying to influence choice, that you were trying to leave people with a different sentiment than they uh, discovered you with. Can you elaborate on that and how that came to influence your perspective on how people make choices? 
Well, actually, no. When I, when I spoke of that, I, I was thinking more about um, my work with um, senior leaders in, in the National mm -hmm. Park Service. Um, every day when I speak and write and think and send emails, I'm thinking about how I'm promoting the work of environmental education and interpretation um, and service and volunteerism within the service. Um, but it absolutely also applies to the way that we work with the general public. So the anatomy of choice, this question I've been marinating on and mulling around, and um, I feel that we make choices because we care about something. Um, it might be that we care about money or getting a Mercedes Benz or, or um, having something we, we had to go without as a child. Um, or it may be that we care about our own children desperately and by extension many more children. And, um, or it may, be that, you know, there, it may be that we care about a sustainable economy um, and making sure that we continue to have a country that, that thrives where there are jobs. Um, there are a lot of different things we care about. And when we're trying to help influence um, choices, um, we have to be able to speak to what people care about and make the case according to what they think, want, believe, and care about. And, and that's really what we do as interpreters. Um, we have a, a slogan that says, the visitor is sovereign. To me, and, and that interpretation happens in the visitor. This is about visitors bringing their own sets of values and beliefs into a place. Um, and our job is to help facilitate a connection between those visitors and the place to leave them caring about the place, and then by extension, the planet. Um, and so we don't want to preach to visitors about climate change. We want to speak to what people personally care about and how climate is, uh, climate change is affecting what they care about in their future. Um, we have uh, uh, some recent studies that show that the vast majority of the visitors, and we have 300, this year we talked to over 300 million visitors to national parks, which is more than like all of professional sports all together. Um, it's, it's huge, which is great, right? People are coming and they're having transformative experiences. And they're coming to care about place and by extension, the planet. Or they're coming to care about the American narrative and our history and by extension, democracy. And while we know that our ultimate goal of what we're trying to do is have a scientifically literate, uh, uh, a civically engaged society that will care and make those choices, what we're really doing every day is just facilitating those little connections to help someone care. And I'll give you an example, two quick examples. Um, so the Every Kid in a Park program, ha hopefully many of you have heard of Every Kid in a Park. It's an interagency program. And I think we have, some inter we have some Every Kid in a Park people here. There's a couple sessions on it. Um, it's a partnership between five different federal agencies, Forest Service, uh, Fish and Wildlife Service, BLM, NOAA, Park Service, um, Bureau of Recommend. I'm going to forget if I try to list them all. Um, but this was an initiative of President Obama's. And so Michelle Obama cares about children's health. That's what she cares about, and she's made that a priority of her first lady's uh, presidency. And so we were able, a, a variety of people, were able to make the case and with data that shows that kids are healthier if they go outside and play. And kids are healthier, you saw from the video, kids are healthier, we have evidence that kids are healthier if, um, if they have time in nature and they connect to nature. And so this got turned into a presidential initiative. And at first, the, the president wanted to give every child in the United States a free pass to America's public lands and waters. Now, that didn't become economically feasible. But to be able to give all of one grade, 4 million fourth graders, every single year a free pass to bring their families and their friends and their extended families back. So that's, a, that, that's an example of an, a decision that a very influential lawmaker made because they care about something and we were able to make the case for what we do as how it supports what they care about. Wonderful.
Wonderful. So let me, I'm going to tweak this question a little bit for the remaining panelists to uh, consider this when you answer the question about choice. A lot of what I've heard so far is a form of self-interest, right? We've heard, you know, you can be healthier, you can um, be more, do better in school, and, and this connection between physical environmental experiences and individual well-being. How do we take that individual well-being and propel it to scale? How do we get businesses to engage in their self-interest, since doing the right thing is not really what CEOs are held accountable for, right? Even pension fund managers who are trying to consider environmental factors in the way they deploy their investments can't really consider anything but the performance of that portfolio. So how do we get large-scale decision makers, be it policy makers, financial managers, businesses, to tap into that self-interest, but not so much on an individual level, but on a, on a much, much larger scale level? Yeah, and I know that you travel throughout the world trying to influence not just individuals, but large-scale organizations. What's the role of self-interest? Or are we really just, to use Julia's uh, phrase, preaching to them about doing the right thing? Uh, I don't think so. Uh, being an educator myself and in environmental education really a practitioner, I, I would like to say that there are two key words which I, in fact, uh, also feel very strongly going around here and that is passion and engagement. The passion and the engagement that you have, and we can hear it, whenever there is a break, the voices are up here. <laughs> and I think this is a key factor in environmental education. And also understanding that the frame of environmental education, for me, it is a very holistic frame. I see environmental education as a cake in three parts. Formal education in schools, colleges, universities, etc. Training of staff, and not to forget what you talked about, awareness raising. And since 87, when we got uh, uh, our common future from Gro Harlem Brundtland and the introduction of sustainable development, it builds on three pillars. So both the cake and the sustainable development is a mirror of the society. And when you meet people that are engaged and passionate in their explanation and educating those things, you convince. And I think sometimes that environmental educators do not see their role as well as political lobbyists. You have such an important role to play, and you're right, Noah. I have, because my life has turned out to be that, used it and use this passion and engagement. And I must say, it is a door opener. And for the foundation, we have been heavily, heavily financially supported by private enterprises over the last seven, eight years. Foundations from this country, from all around the world, coming with the CSR policy and saying, what you are doing is what we believe in. We should have a more sustainable future uh, for all the people. So I think, Passion and engagement in this context are two key words to change not only uh, the world, but also change those that are able to help us and pay what we are doing. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. Kartikeya, in India, the, the anatomy of choice. Does this sound familiar? Is it, is it a global concept? It is, but it's a complex thing. I don't think there's a, like a magic bullet answer to that. Uh, now, you self told me, you told me you had the answer to this when we talked earlier. So. The self-interest, the self-interest, if you really thought that people would behave by self-interest, then what, why would anyone smoke today? I mean, it's, it's very personal. The evidence is overwhelming. It's been around since the 60s, but people yet smoke and, and educated people. And so I think you have to go beyond looking at self-interest. Self-interest is one. There again, the question is, what is self? Is it me? Is it my family? Is it my, my community? Is it my nation? Uh, is it the planet? So ultimately, you want, through environmental education, people to think of self as the planet. It is our planet, and those wonderful slides yesterday, where who is the self? The self is, we are trying to protect ourselves as, as planet. But you, you see how people are taking decisions in different contexts. We had, when we were starting, uh, a group of women who sold vegetables on the street. And the police and the government was getting them to, to, to sort of clearing them away because the road was for, for, for transport. 
And then I was approached by this group saying, can you have a conference or seminar? And we got three of these women to give the keynote, if you like. And what they said was that India, independent India, is not able to give us a job, not able to give us, uh, not able to give us income, another thing. We are not complaining. We only wanted a three feet by two feet space to sell vegetables. And we are not complaining. We are doing everything else ourselves. And how come you can't do that? And the commissioner, and we did the seminar under a tree. And he said, he, he made that a pedestrian zone. And he came to me and said, Karthika, if you had brought these same women to my room, I would have given you tea, but I would not have agreed to it. But somehow sitting under that tree and, and seeing, being in nature gets, just gave me a different perspective. I said, what's it all about? Why is the street only for cars? Why is it not for people? And, and, and I think it, it depends on that context. One very big problem we all have is the time frame. If something happens, we, we participate in an earthquake relief. And because that earthquake happened in a few seconds, we all think of it as a crisis. Like if there's a plane crash, there's a crisis. 300 people dead. But 600 people dying on the road over, over the year is not a crisis because we somehow don't see it in that perspective. And we need to bring time into it. So I think we need to look at it. But I think at the end, people change because they have that last mile connectivity. It's like cooking. You know, when you want to cook something, you, you want to know that exact amount. You don't want to just know concepts. And there was a wonderful thing in Perth, in Australia, for instance, where they were trying to convert people from using private cars to, to uh, using public transport. And what they found, what this NGO did, was to meet each individual in that office and saying, Noah, here's your ticket. I know you come from here. Will you try it once? One day, instead of your car, will you? And I'm going to give you a ticket. And that approach converted 15% people from private to public. But they needed that one last thing. It was not as if they couldn't buy that ticket themselves, but they needed that last push. And, and often it is that last push. It's someone, a friend, someone who, who reinforces that this choice is okay. It's not completely outlandish. And I think that's where opinion leaders come in sometimes because we see it and that's why advertisements use it. But therefore, I think the environmental education through that sense of connecting, not only are you connecting to nature, but you're connecting with each other. And I think in that way, I think you will make that, that right choice. So it's extraordinary since the term education, if you go to any other convening of a different education type, you know, they may talk about applied learning, they may talk about applied experiences, but I haven't heard any of the panelists talk about conventional learning or science or knowledge or truth as being key to making people make the right choices. All I've heard is the physical experiences, the engagements, the personalness of it, the passion, right? That, that doesn't really sound like a classroom education to me. It doesn't even sound like non-formal education. It sounds like something far more physical, something far more personal uh, that is underpinning these choices that we make. Am I, am I hearing right? Well, if I could just go out of turn there and, and say it, it's, I think the classroom is, is key to change. Anyone whose children go to school, they will find very soon the child takes on the, the fact that they are part of another group. They're no longer the family. And therefore, there is that, that tension. They want to do what the, what the other uh -huh. child is doing. Uh -huh. And so the first group away from the family starts in the classroom. And what's right and wrong, and we've got enormous experiences of children going back and telling their parents that you should segregate waste, put them in two cans, or, 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 or things like switch off lights or when you go out. And the parents come to me and saying, look, your program has made a nuisance out of child. <laughs> why, can't, why can't they just do all that at, at the school and not bother us at home? But, but they are doing that. And I think that first sense of we together and that classroom together, that, that we are here to, to really bring about that change and, and we can do it. And I think that's what um, the school does. So I think it's, it's a key part. But the, all those words which you use, passion and commitment and context, all of those are in that program. Our environmental education programs have that. They are all about passion. They are, they are not about just science. Yeah, yeah. The science comes because you are passionate. So I'll take it as a, your answer is it's an and, not an or. Yes, absolutely. Uh, so, okay, very good. Uh, so we'll have one more question for the group, and then we want some tough questions uh, from the audience about 
uh, the anatomy of choice and ultimately the impact that that leads to. Uh, so, and uh, let's see. Uh, yeah, so, yeah, and I'll start with you this time. So, uh, we're living in a time, uh, a lot of people in the audience work for, for NGOs, or organizations that are dependent upon public support. Yes? So, uh, we're living in an age of accountability, right? It's hard to go to a conference where we're not talking about measurement and evaluation, where we're not talking about an evidence-based approach to whatever field you happen to reside in. And it's a wonderfully virtuous thing, but it's also causing a lot of resources to be redeployed towards organizations trying to prove it, right? Uh, when not everything worth doing can be proven necessarily. So let's talk about the notion of, of, of impact and how we know, to Judy's earlier uh, comment, that EE matters. How, how do we make plain to grant makers and other influencers um, that are calling for evidence-based approaches that EE works? Uh, how do we make vivid the impact of this work for generations to come? Uh, and, uh, yeah, Yen, we'll start with the happiest place on earth. What, yeah, uh, and you start with the particionary here. So uh, <laughs> let Good. me do it the Viking way, short and clear. <laughs> um, when the Scottish government decided to make eco-school as part of the national curriculum, that's proof that it works. When UNEP invites our young reporters for the environment students to their different environmental summits around the world to report back to other students. When the theme on, on water in eco school in Uganda doubled the number of female students due to better hygiene when they reach the age of 11. And I just want to continue, inspired by what what Katakai just said before. When I visited this school, and the headmaster told me that normally two-thirds of the young ladies left when they reached the age of 11, 12. And now it has doubled up, so it's two-thirds that continue their uh, education due to the eco-school theme on water. He said, I want to bring you to our villages, because you have to see that the gutters you have learned us to put underneath the roofs to collect the waters has been brought back by the students from the school, and in the whole village, and the next village, there was gutters around their small houses, and they were collecting water. And the women start singing to me, and I said, wow, what's going on? We appreciate so much we don't have to walk two kilometers to the river with a bucket on our head, and now we can, we can grow vegetables we didn't have before. So that is another proof that we are doing something that changed the world. When municipal boards decide to build sewage system or to better them, to get the blue flag on their beaches, that is a proof of the awareness raising part of the environmental education. And when we as an organization are uh, appointed by UNESCO to be a key player, firstly on the ESD and now on GAP and the Global Sustainable Goals, I think we have proved it. But coming a little bit back, we constantly need evaluations and research to prove it as well. And I must say, especially in this post-factual society, and I do not want to mention any person on TV talking and not realizing any facts. That doesn't belong to this discussion. <laughs> but be in a post fact you know, I didn't do it, but being in a post-factual <laughs> society, the need is bigger than ever. But I also want to, to end my, uh, my little remark here by saying I like the title of Inspiration to Impact, but when we are talking impact, and I've just done it myself, we are always looking backwards. It is important to remember that the impact is the fundament for the future actions and the future environmental education we are going to do. And from my personal life, when I was young and activistic, I thought about myself. When I got parent, I, talk, I, I think about my four daughters. And now where I have 10 grandchildren, it will never stop. The responsibility and the work for a better and more sustainable world. So yes, on the impact, we have to continue. Thank you. Very good, thank you. So uh, <clears throat> Charlotte, you know, there's always those torturous uh, foundation board meetings that insist on charts and graphs, right? Yan is giving us amazing uh, 
sort of living proof examples, real world living proof observational evidence of the impact of environmental education. But yet, uh, I, I'm, I'm a board member on a foundation, so I need charts and graphs. Is that nonsensical? Or is there a role for quantitative data to support um, the nature of the impact that EE has? You've thrown me a softball, but I'm not sure you know where I'm going to throw it back. <laughs> Uh-oh. Um, I love that word vivid. <clears throat> it, uh, it makes me think of the Anecdotes to Evidence Project, <clears throat> which is now called EE Works. Some of us do see vividly through numbers, graphs, statistics, and probabilities. <clears throat> but others of us see vividly through narrative, story, case, and many other ways of knowing. At the research symposium over the last few days, we've had some rich and wonderfully troubling occasions to talk about our own beliefs, some seen and some unseen, about what we know and how we come to know it. And I believe that EE is a field uniquely positioned to privilege both types of views, both ways of knowing, um, ontologies and epistemologies, if you'll just allow me that quick word, uh, in many ways to make that impact valid. We know that the fact that someone knows how to read does not mean they will necessarily go on to higher education. But we also know that few people who go to higher education don't know how to read. Most do. And I think that's the dance in which we must engage as well. We know that everyone who knows about the environment will not necessarily become that actively engaged citizen. But we also know that those who work most effectively towards those goals have been engaged with and participated in environmental ed. So I want to talk for a minute about how we might measure that and specifically about evaluation. Um, this summer, Liz DeMatti and I uh, did interviews with a number of brilliant people, many in this room, um, and asked people a number of questions on behalf of the Pisces Foundation. And in part, we were asking them what these experts thought were the primary needs to improve the culture and capacity of evaluation in EE. The majority of EE organizations are working full tilt with minimal staff and without long-term financial security. And as a consequence, I'm afraid I have to say that most EE organizations produce evaluation reports as a necessary end product for a specific grant or funder, rather than as an iterative process that is enculturated throughout the organization towards improvement. We believe that improvement in our field here is critical, and through the interviews, we'd like to suggest three specific possibilities that I'm happy to talk with people about later. First, we would like to continue to work towards a library of shared EE evaluation metrics, measures, and scales, such as the work that Mira is, has been ably started under Michelle Zint and other exemplars, such as NSF. This is critical for creating time-effective pathways to, to quality evaluation for organizational and programmatic improvement, not just funder reporting. Second, we were intrigued to learn that more than 10 years ago, a national summit, the Teton Summit for Environmental Education Evaluation occurred, but only as a one-time occurrence as far as I know. We would like to see a repeat of this and think that regular repetition of that shared national conversation would have great value. Finally, we'd like to also suggest a creative idea of a multi-year regional model training hub for EE evaluation. In this way, e -eval e evaluation expertise is skewed with a few large EENGOs who have staff that are dedicated to evaluation and therefore are able to grow the expertise, and many smaller environmental education organizations who have little or no staff time to dedicate. So the plan would be to implement some model evaluation hubs that would take advantage of expertise both within and outside the, school, the field and would bring people together iteratively over time to make this most effective. By the way, in recent years, EE evaluation experts have offered their services at this conference through one roundtable presentation each year. This, of course, is a limited consulting venue. Nonetheless, if my words are striking a chord with anyone, I encourage you to take advantage of the all-star lineup that Michelle Zint has put together for this year's conference, which will happen tomorrow at 2.15. But in short, I'm making a strong plug that improving the quality of our evaluation to raise our whole field requires shared and communal activities and is really critical to our future growth. Thank you, Charlotte.
So Karthiki, I know you're on your way uh, to meet with a fairly uh, important foundation uh, in the next couple of days. Do you do you have evidence of impact in your in your hip pocket that you're bringing because they have their arms folded? I know wanting to hear. Mm -hmm. Uh, how do you know that this is uh, a return on the investment that they wish to make? You know, I first wanted to go to something David Suzuki said yesterday, sure. which was that over the last 60 years, we've probably tripled our population on this planet. Now, whatever you do, a population which goes, maybe stabilizes at 8 billion or 9 billion or 10 billion is going to have a major impact. There are any number of studies that show that if you educate everyone, especially if you educate the girl child, the population rate goes down. There is no lack of evidence. And yet, the, the, the planet as a whole can't fix this. In 2016, the cost of that entire program is probably the cost of two days of the war which is going on. It's two days of the war. And, and UNESCO, which is running this education for all, begging for money, begging for money, we know how to do it. It's even bad education. If you give people even bad education, even that works, <laughs> let alone good education. No, good education can do wonders, but even bad education, just the fact that you can read, you can write, you go to school uh, till 14 years old, it works. We know it works. Now, we don't need more evidence, but the world does not look up. So you need to ask that, yes, we will get evidence for everything we say, but the things for which evidence is already there, why are you not acting on it? Why are you not acting on the things for which evidence is glaring? And it's not there for now. We, we go to um, small things. I go to a school and I say, um, here are some children. We want to start an environment club, an eco club in your school. And they're going to see that the amount of electricity and water and everything else decreases. Um, so whatever you save over last year, would you give it to the club? And the teacher has, is, yeah, sure, you know, it's nothing. And then, then they actually, schools come and show them how much they saved. And they said, really, it's so much? Because we have to give this? And then after two years, they come and ask us, how many years were we supposed to do this? You know, how, how long are we supposed to fund it? Because there is a number. The electricity meter generates a number. It generates a number in a school which says that compared to last year, this is what has happened with the same number of schools. Now, there are many things for which you can generate that number. And it's, it's good to generate that number and, and give it. But what we did earlier this year was when the sustainable development goals came about, and, and um, uh, you, you've seen those, the 17 goals. Goal four is education. But the rest of the 16 goals, we had, we had groups working on what is the role of education for all the other 16 and what is the existing evidence, and what is the evidence we need. And you will find that the existing evidence is enormous of what you can do. You need much more. You need more. And that is the reason why, why educators and, and people in this room need to connect with practitioners who, as, as you were saying, Charlotte, neither, sometimes they don't have the money, but many times they don't have the skills. Many of the small people or small groups which are doing wonderful things just don't have the resources or the skills to put it in those charts which make sense to, to, the, to the policy makers we require. So I think we need to tackle it in two ways. One is, yes, we should bring in more evidence for what we are saying. We should, we should make it specific, but we should not live under the illusion that giving good evidence, however clear it is, will make that cigarette smoker chain or will make the world people stop one day of war and get schools all over the world. Yeah, wonderful. I, I have to say, um, I have, uh, I am a, a student and you are all my teachers uh, in environmental education, but I have experienced firsthand the struggle that practitioners have with answering this question, well, how do you know? You know, what, what evidence do you have? And it's very, very challenging for the most advanced practitioners to be able to demonstrate those outcomes in vivid, demonstrable ways that lead to increased support from different audiences. So there almost seems to be, if the evidence is ample, then there almost needs to be a, a, a sort of collective uh, engagement of the field in this evidence so that it becomes second nature to the way that you all tell your stories to these practitioners whose support you need, right? Because it sounds like our problem is not evidence. The problem is still a lack of evidence in the face, a lack of action in the face of evidence, which means we're not, we're doing something wrong translationally with the evidence that we have. We need the evidence. 
Yes. We still need the evidence. No, yeah, but I'm hearing we have enough. the evidence. I hear that we're digging deeper for the evidence. Yes. But even evidence exactly. is insufficient. Yes. Julia, now you talked about influencing upwards, not just the public and the like. You know, are you finding policymakers with their arms folded asking for charts and graphs, or is it anecdotal and living proof? What, what are your struggles in trying to influence the places where large-scale decisions are made? Well, it's definitely both. I, I agree with Charlotte that there, there's a need for uh, quantitative data. There's a need for the uh, valid studies that clearly show results, whether it's uh, using qualitative or quantitative methodology, but that you see the, the real data that show the results. Um, but you also need narrative to illustrate the, that data, and you need personal stories, um, and you need testimonials um, to come make it come alive. Because at the at, at the end of the day, human beings we're all we we all thrive on story. We're about story and narrative. That's how our brains work, and how we work in relation to one another. So we have to have both. Um, but I will speak to trying to influence um, within government. Mm -hmm. um, uh, to get more resources for the work of environmental education within the National Park Service particularly, which is where I've spent my energy and time over the past, you know, my, most of my adult life. And, um, and it's interesting because there has been a definite shift in the, um, the value and approach to education and interpretation over the course of the past 25, 30 years. Um, we have gone from um, sort of co corporate culture in the park service of feeling like we have a dual mission, preserve and protect over here, and then provide for enjoyment over here. Um, and, uh, and we've thought about in that way in a dual sort of divided way for years. Now it's clear that the organization culturally looks at one mission, that the two things are like a cycle. Um, you preserve and protect for public enjoyment, but if you don't have public enjoyment and public engagement, public passion, public support, you won't be able to preserve and protect for two reasons, right? One reason is because we've learned in the past 30 years that we can't just set aside a piece of property and put a wall around it and say it's saved, right? Because that we are that's part of an ecosystem, right? And we've learned about systems thinking over the past 40 years or so. And we've learned that what happens outside the boundaries of that place are going to affect whether or not it, it, it is preserved. And so we know that the behaviors um, of people outside the boundaries of parks impact whether or not we're able to save the park um, and conserve the resources for the future generations, whether we can do that mission. And m most of the people in the Park Service are dedicated to that mission, that preserve and protect. They live it. They, they love it. They care deeply. Um, and so uh, as we've been learning about what it takes to accomplish that part of the mission, we've been learning that we need a public that understands, supports, and is engaged with the preservation mission. Um, another reason, though, very self-serving reason, is because Congress allocates our budget. And Congress is responsible to the people of the United States. And if the people of the United States don't care about the parks, don't find them relevant, don't, don't understand the mission and why we need to protect these things, then they, they won't support Congress in supporting our budget, or they won't help us get more money. So what's happened is a shift. And this shift has happened because there have been a lot of people inside the organization explaining the power of learning and education. And there's been a lot of people outside the organization, both domestically and worldwide, who've been doing the same work and doing the research. Um, and we've been able to make the case to upper management that, that the, this work is incredibly uh, central to the mission of the Park Service. Um, and, and so it's been a combination of using uh, data, using story and anecdote, um, showing how this work helps get done something that they care a lot about. They care about the preservation of parks and they care about the 100-year-old the institution of the National Park Service. And they don't want to see it go away in the next century. All of those things have conspired together to help us see a shift toward support. And there's evidence of that shift. So one piece of evidence is that my job, the Associate Director for Interpretation, Education, and Volunteerism, did not exist six years ago. 
Um, there was no top level, senior level director of education for the Park Service. Education was buried several layers down and it was seen primarily strictly as visitor services. We have to take care of these visitors. We have to move them around. We have to give them what they need. We, you know, we, we have to, you know, we have to give them good tours and so forth. But it wasn't that we need to take care of our visitors and create transformative experiences for them so they will care about and then go home and act mm -hmm. on behalf mm -hmm. of these places. So that's been a shift. So just the, just the establishment of a senior management level job um, is one in indicator. Another indicator is that there's a piece of legislation sitting in front of Congress right now as part of our centennial bill that, that clearly states that education is core to the mission of the National Park Service. And some of you may go, why do we need that piece of legislation? And the answer is because we have had um, previous presidential administrations who have said that education is mission creep, that have told us we are not to be doing it, um, that we are strictly about facilitating simple recreation ex experiences, and that we should stay out of the business of trying to teach people. Um, and so the legislation is there to make it clear that this is something we will do and Congress is mandating us to do it. So those pieces of tangible evidence mm -hmm. show that the organization that maybe 30 years ago didn't understand the power of education has now done really significant things to support well, that role keep, going keep forward. Keep fighting the good fight on behalf of all of us. Thank you so much. We keep trying. All so. of us. All of you. Now, uh, Judy has ever so subtly reminded me uh, <laughs> that we are drifting past our allotted time, even though she stole the first 10 minutes of our time. Uh, so, did, did It was you, four minutes. Did you, did, did you have something that you wish to, do we have time no. for questions? No, or? why don't, let me, let me just ask the powers above, can we take another five minutes, Christiana? Yes. Okay. So why not? I have a couple of quick announcements. Let's take a couple of questions. And Sai, can you put up the Twitter feed just so you can see some of the comments? Okay. Quick hands for quick questions. And uh, we have mic runners if you want to ask this amazing panel. Now, come on. We have to punish Judy for standing on stage in the middle of our discussion. We need questions. Hands? Hungry people. Just hungry people. They can smell the food. Yeah. Yeah. Really? No? Yes. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, wait, I wrote it. Uh, you all say that inspiration comes from nature contact. At Mexico, there's a proposal to close all Susan's and aquariums and use the technology to project videos about animals so that kids can learn from them. What is your opinion about it? Anyone? I'll take a shot okay, at Julia, it. Thank you. Um, so, I think that it, it's not either or, it's both and. And what it sounds like to me is that um, there's a desire to, to get rid of the personal experience in favor of the digital experience. Now, we have lots of evidence that the digital experience is really important. We have cancer patients who write to us to say the bear cam at Katmai is keeping me going emotionally. I can turn on these cam video cams and I can see wildlife when I can't leave my hospital room. So it's powerful. We have people who care about places they're never going to get to see around the world because they can see them digitally. But it can't be either or. Right? It, the, the, the digital experience has to um, enhance, engage, and inspire the physical experience and vice versa. And I think if, if the, the, the digital experience will only work, I think, if people have had direct experience with nature, even if it's just in their backyard, even if it's just the, you know, the patch of green that is in the middle of the town square. So I think it's not either or, it's both in, and I would say that that is a very short-sighted way of looking at things. Okay, Jan, real quick, and then I'm going to pass the baton over so I can stay employed. Yeah. I just want to say when, when, and it's not directly to the question, but it was when you introduced the digital part of it, there's one thing that frustrates me enormously the last couple of months. 
And that is why on earth wasn't it an environmental educator that came up with the idea of Pokemon and not artificial figures out there, but three flowers, birds, etc., to get the youngsters out and use the digital play in our environmental education. So the, I agree, it is both and not either or. So for a resource constrained sector, we have a lot of ands, not ors. <laughs> Uh, so look, would you all join me? I know we're hungry. Let's thank this incredible panel.